extended review for the management of massive and irreparable rotator cuff tears. Kamal Gokus MD, Associate Professor, Baskent University Alanya Research and Practice Center, Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology. Acknowledgement. I would like to thank to the authors Delaney R.A., Lynn A., Warner J.J., for their exceptional review regarding the management of massive and irreparable rotator cuff tears. This video has been produced from some article sources. One main article source was written by Delaney et al. The original knowledge can be found below citation. Delaney R.A., Lynn A., Warner J.J. Non-arthroplasty options for the management of massive and irreparable rotator cuff tears. Clin Sports Med. 2012 October, 314, 727-48. Key Points. A massive rotator cuff tear is not necessarily irreparable, and an irreparable tear is not always massive. Number of tendons involved, tissue quality, and decreased acromyohumeral distance are as important as tear size in determining reparability. Debridement of irreparable tears may have a role in low functional demand patients but results deteriorate over time. Patients who do not have pseudoporalysis or advanced cuff tear arthropathy can benefit from biceps tenotomy or tenodesis. Suprascapular neuropathy has been shown to be a potential neurogenic cause of pain in massive rotator cuff tears. Tendon transfers offer good results in patients with massive, irreparable rotator cuff tears who have intact deltoid function and disabling weakness but not pseudoporalysis. Introduction The definition of massive or irreparable rotator cuff tears is not always consistent, but attempts have been made to rationalize this description. Pater 1 proposed a classification system of rotator cuff tears to allow the comparison of treatment results for specific lesions and to allow an analysis of results obtained by different groups and treatment regimens. He categorized tears based on the extent of the tear, the topography of the tear in the sagittal plane, the topography of the tear in the frontal plane, the quality of the muscle, and the state of the long head of the biceps. In terms of the extent of the tear, there were four groups of tears, with group 3 being large or massive tears defined as full substance tears involving more than one tendon and at least 4 cm long in the sagittal plane, and group 4 being massive tears with osteoarthritis of the humeral head. Cofield and colleagues defined a massive rotator cuff tear as a tear of 5 cm or more. Burkhart used a similar definition of a massive tear as one that is at least 5 cm long with no superior coverage, referred to by Rockwood for as a bald head. Gerber and colleagues commented that there was no universal agreement on the definition of a massive tear, and believed that it was more appropriate to describe the tear in terms of the amount of tendon that has been detached from the tuberosities rather than as a discrete number such as 5 cm because of variations in patient size and techniques of measurement. He defined a rotator cuff tear as massive if it involved the detachment of at least two entire tendons, noting that most massive tears involve the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, but that anterior superior tears involving the supraspinatus and subscapularis also occur with moderate frequency. Warner and colleagues supported the use of Gerber and colleagues' definition as a more functional definition than one based on a simple measurement of the length of the tear because an exact measurement of the length of the tear can be made only after the edges of degenerative tendon tissue have been debrided. These investigators also point out that a massive tear is not necessarily irreparable, and an irreparable tear is not always massive. In a separate article, Warner and Parsons described an irreparable tear as one characterized by the inability to achieve a direct repair of native tendon to the proximal humerus despite mobilization of the remaining tissue with conventional techniques of soft tissue release. These tears are often chronic in nature and result in attritional changes in both the tendon substance and muscle fibers. Acute massive tears may be larger than 5 cm but may have tendon that is good quality and easily repaired to its anatomic insertion. Conversely, a small chronic tear may have thin, inelastic, friable tissue that is impossible to mobilize and repair. According to Warner, an acromyohumeral humeral distance less than 5 mm figure, usually means that the tear involves at least two tendons of the rotator cuff, 
and this in combination with magnetic resonance imaging MRI, showing severe muscle atrophy with advanced fatty degeneration of the muscles see figure, indicates an irreparable tear. He notes that fewer than 5% of rotator cuff tears remain irreparable, attributed to poor tissue quality as much as tear size. Figure A. True anteroposterior radiograph showing superior migration of the humeral head and decreased acromia humeral distance. B. Sagittal T1 image of the same patient with severe gout alia grade 4 fatty degeneration of the subscapularis, supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Limited non-arthroplasty surgical options exist for the treatment of irreparable rotator cuff tears. Debridement of the tear, open or arthroscopic, and acromioplasty may be appropriate under certain circumstances, such as for the low-demand patient. Burkhart and colleagues have shown that partial repair of massive irreparable rotator cuff tears can result in a dramatic improvement in function when the normal mechanics of the shoulder are restored, rather than striving to achieve full coverage of the defect. The long head of the biceps tendon has been implicated as a source of pain in irreparable rotator cuff tears, and therefore there can be a role for biceps tenotomy in the treatment of this disorder. Rotator cuff augmentation with allografts or extracellular matrix scaffolds, such as acellular human dermis and small intestinal submucosa, has shown mixed results, and level 1 evidence is lacking. Suprascapular neuropathy, SSN, has been shown to be a potential neurogenic cause of pain with massive rotator cuff tears. Boykin and colleagues have shown that suprascapular neuropathy, SSN, as proved on electrodiagnostic studies, is more frequent in patients with massive rotator cuff tears, and Lofos and colleagues have reported positive results of arthroscopic decompression of the nerve in this population. Partial repair of a massive rotator cuff tear may change the tension on the nerve and may be another mechanism of pain relief in suprascapular neuropathy. Tendon transfers may be an option in appropriate patients. Patients without glenure humeral arthritis but with marked weakness and pain in the setting of a massive, irreparable rotator cuff tear can benefit from a tendon transfer. Latissimus dorsi transfer to reconstruct a massive posterior superior rotator cuffed ear was originally developed by Gerber. Patients with a functional impairment who may also have loss of external rotation strength can be considered for this procedure if they do not have pseudoparalysis. Pectoralis major transfer has been used in some cases to reconstruct an irreparable subscapularis tear. In this review, we provide evidence-based guidelines for non-arthroplasty options in the treatment of massive, irreparable rotator cuff tears. Most of the available evidence is level 4 evidence because prospective controlled studies are rare and generally not feasible, or in many cases unethical, for surgical studies. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, AAOS, Clinical Practice Guideline on Optimizing the Management of Rotator Cuff Problems was of limited usefulness because of the lack of strong recommendations, the one guideline dealing specifically with irreparable rotator cuff tears, which stated that it is an option to perform partial rotator cuff repair, debridement, or muscle transfers for patients with irreparable rotator cuff tears when surgery is indicated had a strength of recommendation that was graded as weak. It is important to consider each patient as an individual, both in terms of their expectations and functional demands, as well as their ability to undergo intensive rehabilitation protocols, before deciding which treatment course to embark upon. This is a concept referred to by Pater 1, that one must consider the patient's somatotype, age, social and professional activities, and degree of expected cooperation in the postoperative period when thinking about the prognosis of an individual shoulder with a rotator cuff tear. Debridement and subacromial decompression. The relief of pain as the primary goal in surgery for the massive rotator cuff tear led to considerable interest in the debridement of massive, irreparable rotator cuff tears combined with some type of acromioplasty or subacromial decompression, without necessarily attempting to repair the rotator cuff tear. This approach may not yield functional benefit in terms of strength and range of motion, but can provide significant benefit in terms of pain relief, particularly in the lower demand patient. In addition, there may be secondary functional gains related to decreased pain. However, 
function generally is not restored, and the effectiveness of this treatment may be limited. Hawkins and colleagues described a series of 100 consecutive patients with full thickness rotator cuff tears who underwent antero inferior partial acromioplasty as described by Nia. 27 of these patients had massive tears, defined as greater than 5 cm. Only 6 patients had tears that were deemed irreparable. The investigators described performing extensive debridement in these six patients, with resection of bursal tissue and anterior acromioplasty. Although the irreparable tears were not analyzed separately, all patients had relief of pain postoperatively. The tear size was correlated to the outcome, in that the smaller the tear, the more likely the recovery of strength and decrease in pain. The status of the deltoid in determining the outcome after the breedment of a massive rotator cuff tear was highlighted by Rockwood and colleagues. All of the patients in this series had irreparable rotator cuff tears treated with open modified near acromioplasty, subacromial decompression, including resection of the coracoacromial ligament, CAL, and debridement of massive tears involving supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Debridement and subacromial decompression. At a 6.5 year follow up, 83% of the 50 patients had satisfactory results. The investigators noted that favorable results were obtained if the anterior deltoid was preserved and if there had been no previous acromioplasty or attempt at rotator cuff repair. They suggested that the pain relief seen postoperatively was a result of adequate subacromial decompression and the preserved functional range of motion was caused by strength in the anterior deltoid and in the remaining subscapularis and teres minor muscles, which was regained through a detailed rehabilitation program. These results suggest that, with proper rehabilitation, adequate decompression of the subacromial space, anterior acromioplasty, and debridement of massive tears of the rotator cuff can lead to the relief of pain and the restoration of function. In Rockwood and colleagues series, the superior portion of the subscapularis or teres minor was rarely involved in the tear. When the subscapularis and teres minor are intact, normal function in the face of unrepaired, massive tears of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus can still occur. This situation is because of the preservation of the force couples in the transverse and coronal planes, as explained by Burkhart. With the advancement of arthroscopy, open debridement and acromioplasty have largely been replaced by arthroscopic methods. Gartsman 8 described 154 shoulders treated with arthroscopic subacromial decompression and no attempt to repair the rotator cuff tear. 25 of these patients had full thickness tears, however, only three of these tears were classified as massive. An important correlation was seen between the final result and the size of the tear. Thirteen of the sixteen patients with a tear measuring less than three centimeters had a satisfactory result, but only one of the nine patients with a tear greater than three centimeters had a satisfactory result, and eight of these nine patients went on to further operative treatment. Gartsman concluded that results were unsatisfactory in patients with a massive rotator cuff tear. The correlation between tear size and results after subacromial decompression was again shown by Levy and colleagues. Of 25 patients treated with arthroscopic subacromial decompression for full thickness rotator cuff tears, all had significantly decreased pain postoperatively but small tears fared better than large tears. In a follow-up study of the same patients, Zvijak and colleagues 26 emphasized that results of subacromial decompression and debridement of full thickness rotator cuff tears deteriorated over time. Large and massive tears fared worse over time than small and moderate tears. The conclusions drawn were that for repairable tears, subacromial decompression and debridement could not be recommended over repair of the rotator cuff but for select patients with irreparable tears, it may have a role. Malilo and Savoir agreed with this conclusion in their comparative study of open repair versus debridement of massive rotator cuff tears, stating that results of debridement deteriorate significantly with time and are not acceptable. This theory was echoed by Elman and colleagues who stated that arthroscopic subacromial decompression and debridement of full thickness rotator cuff tears has a valuable, but limited, role in carefully selected patients. They noted that patients with massive, irreparable tears did not regain strength or range of motion, 
but did have significant pain relief. Looking specifically at patients with massive, irreparable rotator cuff tears, Gartsman reported on a series of 33 patients. All patients had at least a 5 cm tear involving two or more tendons that could not be repaired without excessive tension. Open debridement and subacromial decompression led to a significant decrease in pain and an increase in range of motion and ability to perform activities of daily living. Gartsman noted that strength in elevation was decreased postoperatively. The results were inferior to rotator cuff repair. However, comparison with patients with tears that were possible to repair may not be reasonable, because patients with massive, irreparable tears are generally older, may have a biceps tear or superior migration of the humeral head, and often have poorer quality muscle and tendon tissue. To better compare open repair and arthroscopic debridement of full thickness rotator cuff tears, Montgomery and colleagues randomized 88 shoulders to receive one of these treatments. Although no distinction was made between reparable and irreparable tears, 50% of the debridement group and 28% of the repair group had massive rotator cuff tears, greater than 5 cm. Within each group, results were better in younger patients with smaller tears, but this did not reach statistical significance. 5 of 19 patients in the debridement group went on to develop cuff tear arthropathy and were treated with hemiarthroplasty. The investigators concluded that arthroscopic debridement and subacromial decompression was inferior to rotator cuff repair. Size of tear, patient age, or activity level did not correlate with the results achieved by arthroscopic debridement, and it was not possible to identify any consistent parameters that would define a group of patients who would do well with arthroscopic debridement alone. Burkhart emphasizes two important force couples as the key factor in predicting the success of debridement and subacromial decompression. The first force couple is in the coronal plane between the deltoid and the inferior rotator cuff. The second force couple is in the transverse plane between the anterior cuff, subscapularis, and the posterior cuff, infraspinatus and teres minor. Normal function in the face of an unrepaired rotator cuff tear can still be achieved, but only if these force couples remain intact. Figure. This balance depends on the integrity of the anterior cuff, the posterior cuff, and the deltoid. Most massive rotator cuff tears extend to involve the posterior cuff, and involvement of subscapularis is less common, therefore the crucial point in determining whether to repair the rotator cuff is the status of the posterior rotator cuff. In a massive tear, the posterior cuff may be torn so badly that it is unable to balance the moment created anteriorly by subscapularis, which then leads to an inability to maintain the equilibrium of the glenohumeral fulcrum in the transverse plane. This situation can cause such a decrease in the moment developed by the inferior cuff that it can no longer maintain equilibrium in the coronal plane, giving a net effect of anterior superior translation of the humeral head with attempted elevation. An intact posterior cuff is key to successful treatment by arthroscopic acromioplasty and debridement. Burkhart found that strength of resisted external rotation was a reliable preoperative indicator of intact posterior cuff. Furthermore, Burkhart stated that the dynamic transverse and coronal plane force couples, as outlined earlier, are more important than any passive constraint or humeral head depressing action provided by the long head of the biceps. Wiley described superior humeral head migration as a complication of rotator cuff debridement and bursal decompression in a case series of four patients. Two of these patients had undergone hemiarthroplasty for fracture, and in these patients it was the prosthesis that migrated superiorly. In all four patients, attempts had been made to repair the massive rotator cuff tear. In every case, the cal had been divided. In two patients, bone graft was used to re-establish the subacromial arch from the coracoid process to the undersurface of the acromion, with good pain relief and correction of deformity. Wiley concluded that debridement alone may lead to upward dislocation of the humeral head and an increase in disability. The issue of superior humeral head migration and the importance of the coracoacromial arch was further explored by subsequent investigators. Fagelman and colleagues performed a cadaveric study on seven shoulders, 
A significant decrease in anterior superior migration was found after cal reconstruction compared with both anterior acromioplasty and modified near acromioplasty. The investigators deduced that in patients with massive rotator cuff tears, reconstruction of the coracoacromial ligament may provide the necessary stabilizing force to prevent excessive anterior superior translation and possible humeral head escape from the coracoacromial arch. They suggest that only minimal bone should be resected when performing acromioplasty, and the coracoacromial ligament should be preserved when possible. They also recommend that when the coracoacromial ligament preservation is not possible, anatomic reconstruction of the medial band of the, the coracoacromial ligament is warranted in patients with coracoacromial arch deficiency. Flato and colleagues examined the coracoacromial ligament reconstruction in vivo in a series of 16 patients undergoing repair of a massive rotator cuff tear. The, the coracoacromial ligament was repaired with bone sutures to the acromion. Of 10 patients available for follow up, 8 had satisfactory results and were able to perform overhead activities. 2 had unsatisfactory results. There were no cases of anterior superior humeral head subluxation. Although these were not irreparable rotator cuff tears, this series shows that acromioplasty with coracoacromial ligament preservation or repair maintains some of the passive stabilizing effects of the coracoacromial arch. In 2002, Fenlin and colleagues introduced a new procedure for the treatment of massive, irreparable rotator cuff tears that facilitated coracoacromial ligament preservation. This procedure was described as a tuberoplasty, which involves the removal of exostosis on the humerus followed by reshaping of the greater tuberosity to create a smooth, congruent acromiohumeral articulation. The coracoacromial ligament is preserved and an acromioplasty is not performed. The investigators reported on 20 patients with a minimum of 27 months follow-up all of whom had disabling pain preoperatively. All patients had a tear of at least 5 cm involving both supraspinatus and infraspinatus, two also had partial subscapularis tears. In all cases, rotator cuff repair was abandoned because of excessive retraction or poor tissue quality after mobilization, or both. In the tuberoplasty procedure, the acromion and coracoacromial ligament are left intact until a decision is made about the reparability of the cuff. The investigators emphasize that it is vital to make this determination before violating the coracoacromial arch. There were 12 excellent results, 6 good, and 1 fair. 68% of patients were totally pain-free and no patient had night pain postoperatively. All patients had residual external rotation weakness. These results, although clearly showing improvements in pain and function, are still inferior to results achieved with acromioplasty and repair of the rotator cuff. The investigators conclude that despite the role of the acromion and coracoacromial ligament in the pathogenesis of impingement syndrome, its importance in a select group of patients with massive, irreparable rotator cuff tears cannot be overemphasized. The breedment of massive rotator cuff tears and subacromial decompression, although overall inferior to repair of the rotator cuff when possible, may still have a role in elderly, low demand patients for whom pain relief is the priority and functional goals are limited. Results have been shown to deteriorate over time. Satisfactory results are most likely to be achieved in patients in whom the integrity of the deltoid is preserved and who have good external rotation strength preoperatively, indicating an intact posterior rotator cuff. Burkhart coined the term margin convergence to describe the side-to-side -side closure of massive, U-shaped rotator cuff tears. He recognized that most massive rotator cuff tears are not retracted but are L-shaped tears with a vertical split from medial to lateral which assume a U-shape because of the elasticity of the muscle tendon unit. Burkhart cited McLaughlin as advocating a repair that used a combination of side-to-side tendon-to-tendon sutures and end-on-tendon-to-bone sutures in the 1940s. Furthermore, Burkhart stated that mobilization of these tiers leads to failure of repair because of tension overload at the apex of the tier, whereas side-to-side -side closure gives a mechanical advantage because of a biomechanical principle called margin convergence. In the technique of margin convergence, the free margin of the tier converges toward the greater tuberosity as the side-to-side -side repair progresses, figure. As the margin converges, 
the strain at the free edge of the cuff is reduced significantly, leaving an almost tension-free converged cuff margin overlying the humeral bone bed for repair. Side-to-side -side closure of two-thirds of a U-shaped deer reduces the strain at the cuff margin to one-sixth of the strain that existed at the pre-converged cuff margin. This strategy gives a lower probability of failure of fixation to bone, either by anchors or transosseous tunnels. Figure, A, U-shaped rotator cuff tear. B, partial side-to-side -side repair causes a margin convergence of the tear toward the greater tuberosity, which increases the cross-sectional area and decreases the length of the tear, thereby decreasing strain. Reprinted from Burkhart SS. Arthroscopic treatment of massive rotator cuff tears. Clin Orthoprel Rees 2001 semicolon 390 to 109, with permission. In the technique of margin convergence, the free margin of the tear converges toward the greater tuberosity as the side to side repair progresses, figure. As the margin converges, the strain at the free edge of the cuff is reduced significantly, leaving an almost tension free converged cuff margin overlying the humeral bone bed for repair. Side-to-side -side closure of two-thirds of a U-shaped tear reduces the strain at the cuff margin to one-sixth of the strain that existed at the pre-converged cuff margin. This strategy gives a lower probability of failure of fixation to bone, either by anchors or transosseous tunnels. After placing side-to-side -side sutures, the free margin of the cuff is repaired to the bone with suture anchors. Reprinted from Burkhart SS. Arthroscopic treatment of massive rotator cuff tears. Clin Orthoprel Rees 2001.390.114. With permission. The principles of margin convergence and force couples must be followed when attempting to repair of a massive rotator cuff tear. Partial repair, in which there is a defect remaining in the superior portion of the cuff after margin convergence can still be effective if at least half of the infraspinatus can be repaired to the bone. Burkhardt recommends partial repair whenever complete closure of the defect is not possible and advises against local transfers of rotator cuff tendons. In truly non-mobile tears, an interval slide as described by Tauro 35 sometimes allows an additional 1 to 2 cm of lateral excursion of the supraspinatus tendon and therefore permits a greater degree of partial repair. The results of this technique are variable. Partial repair has been studied in a rat model by Sue and colleagues comparing no repair, infraspinatus repair, or two tendon repair four weeks after detachment of infraspinatus and supraspinatus in 48 rats. Quantitative ambulatory measures performed in each group, medial slash lateral forces, braking, propulsion, step width, were significantly different between the no repair group and the infraspinatus repair group and were similar between the infraspinatus and the two tendon repair groups. The investigators concluded that repairing the infraspinatus back to its insertion site without repair of the supraspinatus can improve shoulder function to a similar extent as repairing both infraspinatus and supraspinatus. Mazoku and colleagues examined in a cadaveric study whether there was the biomechanical rationale for performing margin convergence in large, retracted rotator cuff tears. 20 cadaveric shoulders in which the supraspinatus muscle tendon unit was removed to create a large retracted rotator cuff tear were tested. Margin convergence was performed in an open fashion by placing simple sutures 5 mm apart beginning at the glenoid rim medially and proceeding laterally. The gap area was measured after each suture was placed. There was a statistically significant gap closure with each suture, 50% with the first suture, 60% with the second suture, 67% with the third suture, and 75% with the fourth suture, p-value is lower than 0.05. Infraspinatus and supraspinatus strain were measured for each specimen in the intact state, after supraspinatus removal, after each convergence suture was placed and in different positions of rotation and abduction. When comparing infraspinatus strain and subscapularis strain before and after margin convergence was performed, 
The investigators found that strain was significantly reduced at all degrees of rotation at zero degrees of abduction after margin convergence sutures were placed, p-value is lower than 0.05. Testing was also conducted to calculate glenure humeral joint translation and to measure tension in the rotator cuff itself during knot tying and gap closure. The investigators found that there was minimal tension and stress in the rotator cuff during knot tying. Infraspinatus and subscapularis strain increased slightly as the tendons were pulled together during knot tying. The first margin convergence suture caused the greatest increase in intrinsic rotator cuff tension, with each subsequent suture having a similar but less dramatic effect. Overall, mean anterior translation of the humeral head was minimal. The results obtained support the hypothesis that margin convergence decreases the size of the tear gap and reduces strain with minimal effect on glenure humeral translation and intrinsic tendon strain during knot tying. Biceps tenotomy and tenodesis. Pato alluded to the relevance of the long head of the biceps in his proposed system of classification of rotator cuff tears. Walsh observed in the late 1980s that many patients with chronic rotator cuff tears experience pain relief after rupturing the long head of the biceps, once the acute episode subsides. He, therefore, hypothesized that selected patients with chronic rotator cuff tears may benefit from tenotomy of the long head of the biceps. He subsequently reported long-term follow-up. 2 to 14 years, on 307 patients with full thickness rotator cuff tears treated with tenotomy of the long head of the biceps. All patients had a symmetric passive range of motion with the contralateral shoulder. Patients were selected for biceps tenotomy if the rotator cuffed ear was irreparable, or if the patient was older and unwilling to undergo the rehabilitation required after rotator cuff repair. There was a significant improvement in the mean constant score from 48.4 to 67.6 .6 after biceps tenotomy, and 87% of patients were satisfied or very satisfied with their results. The acromia humeral distance decreased by 1.3 mm during the follow-up period and was associated with a longer duration of follow-up. Preoperatively 38% of patients had glenure humeral arthritis, at the latest follow-up 67% had arthritis. Only patients with an acromia humeral interval of greater than 6 mm gained a statistically significant benefit from concomitant acromioplasty. Terry's minor atrophy in patients with fatty infiltration of infraspinatus was found to negatively influence many clinical and radiographic outcome parameters. In multivariate regression analysis, the three factors found to most influence postoperative adjusted constant scores were, preoperative adjusted constant score, fatty infiltration of the subscapularis muscle, and fatty infiltration of the infraspinatus muscle. 1% of patients underwent subsequent rotator cuff repair, and 2% of patients underwent later surgery for cuff tear arthropathy. No cosmetic deformity as a result of biceps tenotomy was identifiable in approximately half of the patients. No patient rated their result as fair or poor because of cosmosis. The investigators conclude that in selected patients, Biceps tenotomy for rotator cuff tears leads to good objective outcomes and high patient satisfaction. They note that it does not alter the progressive degenerative radiographic changes in the glenior humeral joint that are seen with chronic rotator cuff tears. Boileau and colleagues again showed that biceps tenotomy can lead to symptomatic improvement in massive rotator cuff tears, and also showed that biceps tenodesis has the same benefits. In this study, 39 irreparable rotator cuff tears were treated with arthroscopic tenotomy of the long head of the biceps and 33 irreparable tears were treated with arthroscopic biceps tenodesis. Tenodesis was preferentially performed in more active patients and in those less than the age of 65 years. At a mean follow-up of 35 months, 78% of patients were satisfied with the result. The mean constant score improved from 46.3 to 66.5. There were three patients with pseudoparalysis, and these patients did not benefit from the procedure. None of them regained active forward elevation above horizontal. In contrast, the 15 patients with the painful loss of active elevation recovered active elevation. The investigators emphasize the importance, therefore, 
of differentiating between pseudoparalysis and painful loss of active elevation. They furthermore state that pseudoparalysis and severe cuff tear arthropathy are contraindications to biceps tenotomy or tenodesis as a treatment of massive rotator cuff tear. Two patients in this series went on to have reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. 62% of patients with a biceps tenotomy developed a cosmetic deformity but only 16 patients were aware of the deformity and none was bothered by it. Similar to Walsh, Boalo found that absence or atrophy of the teres minor on preoperative imaging was associated with severe fatty infiltration of the infraspinatus and with significant decreases in both postoperative external rotation and the postoperative constant score. Given the influence of the status of the teres minor on final outcomes, Boalo's group now performs an additional latissimus dorsi and teres major transfer when a patient has a severe external rotation deficit with a teres minor that is torn or has fatty infiltration, and the goal is more than simple palliation or pain relief. Suprascapular nerve neuropathy in association with massive rotator cuff tears. There has been increasing interest in recent years in the role of the suprascapular nerve in shoulder pain, particularly when associated with massive rotator cuff tears. Warner and colleagues published a detailed account in 1992 of the anatomy and relationships of the suprascapular nerve. This was a cadaver study to delineate the anatomic relationships of the suprascapular nerve and to define the dangers to this structure with mobilization of a massive rotator cuff tear. One hypothesis was that unexplained clinical failures of lateral advancement techniques used in the treatment of massive rotator cuff tears may have been caused by extensive mobilization causing damage to the neurovascular pedicle to the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Suprascapular nerve neuropathy in association with massive rotator cuff tears. In this study, 31 cadaver shoulders were dissected. In all shoulders, the suprascapular nerve was found to be closely applied to the bony floor of the supraspinatus fossa and was tethered at the suprascapular notch deep to the transverse scapular ligament. Tension on the motor branches was assessed visually and by palpation after disinsertion and advancement of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. When any motor branch became so taut that it could not be moved from side to side, or became avulsed from the muscle, this was considered the limit to the lateral transposition of the muscle. In five shoulders, the amount of mobilization of the cuff that is safely possible through an anterior superior approach and detachment of the deltoid was assessed. This amount was found to be 1 cm. In eight shoulders, a modified advancement technique in which the muscle was advanced laterally within a subperiosteally elevated fascial sleeve was evaluated. Using this technique, neither the supraspinatus nor infraspinatus could be advanced laterally by more than 3 cm. In all shoulders, the limiting factor for lateral advancement of supraspinatus and infraspinatus was tension on the motor branches of the suprascapular nerve. In most shoulders, lateral advancement of the muscle caused the first motor branch of the suprascapular nerve to become kinked under the ligament in the notch. In these shoulders, release of the ligament resulted in an additional 5 mm of lateral advancement of the tendon before the nerve came under tension. The investigators noted that when a tendon has retracted in a chronic rotator cuff tear, the neurovascular bundle may be tethered by scar tissue and may be at even greater risk than suggested by this study. Figure Tethering of the suprascapular nerve with progressive medial retraction of large rotator cuff tendon tears. Reprinted from Costuros J.G., Poromatical M., Lydt, et al. Reversal of suprascapular neuropathy following arthroscopic repair of massive supraspinatus and infraspinatus rotator cuff tears. Arthroscopy 2007.2311.1153. With permission, it was shown that the maximum lateral advancement of the cuff that is permitted by the neurovascular structures is 3 cm, which is less than what is usually required for repair of massive tears of the rotator cuff. This situation may explain failure of supraspinatus or infraspinatus to regain strength after repair of massive rotator cuff tear. Vard and colleagues examined the prevalence of peripheral nerve injury associated with rotator cuff tears with atrophy and found that 7 of 25 patients with full thickness rotator cuff tears had abnormal electromyographic EMG, studies. Of these 7 patients, 
2 had suprascapular nerve neuropathy. Malon and colleagues reported on the prospective, consecutive series of eight patients with massive, more than 5 cm, rotator cuff tears with fatty infiltration and retraction of supraspinatus on MRI. All eight patients had suprascapular nerve neuropathy on EMG. Four patients underwent debridement and partial repair, two of whom underwent follow-up EMG, which showed in both cases that the suprascapular nerve had significant renovation potentials, with almost complete recovery of the nerve in one case. Costuros and colleagues showed reversal of suprascapular nerve neuropathy in patients with massive rotator cuff tears after partial or complete repair. 26 of 216 patients with rotator cuff tears treated operatively were identified to have massive tears associated with retraction and moderate to severe fatty infiltration of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. 14 of these patients were found to have a peripheral nerve injury on EMG, of whom 7 had an isolated suprascapular nerve injury. All 7 underwent arthroscopic treatment of their rotator cuff tear. One tear was not technically reparable at the time of surgery. In the six patients who underwent either partial or complete arthroscopic repair, follow-up EMG slash nerve conduction velocities after six months showed partial or full recovery of the suprascapular nerve palsy, which correlated with complete pain relief and marked improvement in function. Although numbers were small, this study suggests that repair or partial repair of the massive rotator cuff tear by relieving the traction on the suprascapular nerve, may alleviate the associated suprascapular nerve neuropathy without performing direct decompression of the nerve at the time of surgery. In 2007, Lafosse and colleagues described a novel, all arthroscopic technique for decompressing the suprascapular nerve, initially in patients without rotator cuff tears. There is believed to be less postoperative scar formation and fibrosis after an arthroscopic procedure compared with open decompression and, subsequently, less risk of recurrent nerve compression. In a subsequent review article, Lafosse and colleagues discussed the distinction between primary suprascapular nerve compression and secondary compression associated with a massive, retracted rotator cuff tear. It is debatable whether the release of the transverse scapular ligament is necessary once the traction on the suprascapular nerve has been relieved by repairing the rotator cuff. Lafosse states that his approach is to assess the nerve, the notch, and the transverse ligament during rotator cuff repair and to release a thickened or ossified ligament, figure, regardless of EMG findings, because he believes arthroscopic suprascapular nerve release is a safe procedure with little risk of additional complications. He cites his unpublished series of 75 patients with massive rotator cuff tear who had rotator cuff repair, in whom associated suprascapular nerve neuropathy in 29, 39%, was identified by positive EMG preoperatively. All 29 patients underwent an EMG at 6 months postoperatively, of whom 13 had normal EMG, 12 had improvement, and 4 had no change. No statistical difference was identified in this small group between those who had nerve release and those who did not. The role of suprascapular nerve decompression in the management of massive rotator cuff tears, therefore, remains controversial. Boykin and colleagues reviewed 92 patients sent for electrodiagnostic evaluation of the suprascapular nerve over a one-year period, 38 of whom had a massive rotator cuff tear, defined as 5 cm in maximum diameter in the coronal or sagittal plane. Of the patients with an electrodiagnosis of suprascapular nerve neuropathy, 23 patients had a massive rotator cuff tear. 2 had a full thickness tear not considered massive, and 15 did not have a rotator cuff disease. The likelihood of suprascapular nerve neuropathy was greater among patients with a massive rotator cuff tear, 60.5%, than patients without a massive cuff tear, 31.5%, p-value lower than 0.05. The investigators believed that the mechanism of injury to the SSN in this situation was traction from retraction of the rotator cuff musculature. The prevalence of suprascapular nerve neuropathy among patients with a massive cuff tear was lower in those patients who had previously attempted rotator cuff repair compared with those without previous repair, but this did not reach statistical significance.
The investigators also comment that although the suprascapular nerve was previously considered a solely motor nerve, there is increasing evidence that it has a sensory component that can be a major contributor to shoulder pain. This concept is supported by the fact that suprascapular nerve blocks have been shown to significantly decrease pain after shoulder surgery. The investigators conclude that whether rotator cuff repair in the presence of SSN is adequate without additional decompression of the nerve will be answered only in comparative trials. Tendon transfers. Irreparable tears can be defined as those in which direct tendon to bone repair and healing are not possible. Tendon transfers have gained acceptance as a treatment option for this situation. Local tendon transposition, distant tendon transfer, and deltoid flap transposition have all been proposed as methods of reconstructing the rotator cuff. Use of a portion of subscapularis and teres major to cover superior cuff defects has been used with limited success, and results were not reproducible. Distant tendon transfer in the form of latissimus dorsi transfer for massive posterior superior tears and pectoralis major transfers for the less common anterior superior tears have had more reproducible and long term success. Latissimus dorsi transfer. Latissimus dorsi transfer was proposed by Gerber and colleagues in 1988 to reconstruct tears involving complete loss of supraspinatus and infraspinatus. They described the transfer of the latissimus dorsi tendon from its insertion on the humeral shaft to the superolateral humeral head. Converting teres major and latissimus dorsi into external rotators had been previously shown by Lepiscopo to be effective in children with brachial plexus birth palsies. Gerber viewed massive rotator cuff tears as an analogous adult problem. The latissimus dorsi provides a large, vascularized tendon to close the rotator cuff defect. Latissimus dorsi transfer. The transfer of latissimus dorsi to the superolateral humeral head converts latissimus dorsi to a humeral head depressor by virtue of its almost vertical orientation, and into an external rotator by virtue of its insertion relative to the humeral head. It was noted from the outset that this procedure was not designed for shoulders with poor deltoid function. Gerber and colleagues first dissected 12 cadaver shoulders to define the relevant anatomy, and to confirm that the tendon was sufficient to cover at least part of the cuff defect, the length of the tendon enough to allow transfer to the superolateral humeral head and to allow a good range of motion of the shoulder after transfer and that the neurovascular pedicle was constant and long enough to allow the transfer without tension on the neurovascular structures. Latissimus dorsi transfer. Transfer of the latissimus dorsi to the humeral head was easily possible in all 12 cadaveric shoulders. The investigators then applied the technique to 14 patients with massive rotator cuff tears, 9 of whom had a severe functional handicap. The rotator cuff could be closed with the aid of latissimus dorsi in 10 of the 14 cases. Postoperative EMGs in the first 11 patients confirmed normal suprascapular and thoracodorsal nerve function as well as showing that one of the patients had innervated latissimus dorsi during shoulder flexion and three of the patients on external rotation. EMG studies suggested that the latissimus dorsi acted mainly by tenodesis to produce external rotation. Gerber's initial series showed promising results at one-year follow-up, with gains in forward flexion, abduction, control of external rotation in abduction, and a decrease in fatigability of the shoulder for patients using their arm between waist and shoulder level. Gerber did not transfer teres major with latissimus dorsi because the teres major is often too bulky to pass under the deltoid, and because the amplitude and the length of the teres major tendon was considered insufficient. These patients did not achieve the improvements in function and pain seen by those with an intact subscapularis. Gerber concluded that latissimus dorsi transfer durably and substantially improve chronically painful, dysfunctional shoulders with irreparable rotator cuff tears, especially if the subscapularis is intact, but that if subscapularis function is deficient, the procedure is of questionable benefit and probably should not be used. In an anatomic study of 18 cadavers, Morelli and colleagues defined the critical anatomy for latissimus dorsi tendon harvest. 
They emphasized the landmark of a deep fibrous band at the confluence of teres major and latissimus dorsi, figure, and reported that the radial nerve crosses from ventral to dorsal directly beneath the latissimus dorsi, 22.1 mm, standard deviation 3.6 mm, deep to this band, and 36.5 mm, standard deviation 12.7 from the tendon insertion on the humerus, whereas the axillary nerve exits the quadrangular space 27 mm, 8.9, from the humeral insertion of latissimus dorsi and teres major. The investigators found that the distance from the latissimus dorsi insertion on the humerus to its neurovascular pedicle was 110.3 mm, standard deviation of 13.7. They concluded that harvest of the latissimus dorsi tendon can be safely accomplished by identifying the deep fibrous band and releasing the tendon within 2 cm of its humeral attachment. Iannotti and colleagues found that preoperative shoulder function and general strength influence the outcome after latissimus dorsi transfer. In their study of 14 patients undergoing latissimus dorsi transfer for massive rotator cuff tear, women with poor shoulder function had a greater probability of a poor clinical result. The investigators reported that the most significant predictors of outcome were a preoperative active range of motion, and strength in forward flexion and external rotation. The transfer does not overcome pseudoparalysis. Latissimus dorsi transfer as a salvage procedure after failed rotator cuff repair has been shown to be effective. Minnesi and McLeod studied 17 such patients, at a mean follow-up of 51 months. Six of their patients had undergone more than one previous attempted rotator cuff repair. After latissimus dorsi transfer, 14 of the 17 patients had significant pain relief and improvement in function for all activities except lifting heavier than 6.8 kg both active and passive range of motion improved in forward elevation and in internal and external rotation, p-value lower than 0.0001. Seven of eight patients with a detached or non-functioning anterior deltoid had substantial improvement. The investigators could not detect any significant differences, either preoperatively or postoperatively, between patients with intact deltoid and those with a deltoid compromise with regard to pain, function, range of motion, University of California Los Angeles, UCLA, shoulder score, or the overall satisfaction with the shoulder. The investigators make the point that all of these patients are still moderately disabled after this surgery and do not have normal shoulder function. However, they emphasize that there was a significant overall improvement in UCLA scores postoperatively versus preoperative scores implying that latissimus dorsi transfer was an effective procedure for salvage after the failure of repair of a massive rotator cuff tear. Warner and Parsons further developed this concept and compared primary latissimus dorsi transfer with the transfer as a salvage procedure after failed rotator cuff repair. This study compared outcomes of 16 patients who underwent latissimus dorsi transfer as a salvage procedure for failed rotator cuff repair with those of 6 patients who underwent the transfer as a primary procedure for massive irreparable rotator cuff repair, based on a 7-year experience with this technique. Of the 16 revision patients, 3 had undergone more than one previous rotator cuff repair and 7 had undergone a distal clavicle resection. Preoperative modified constant scores were comparable between the groups, a mean of 37% in the primary group and 36% in the salvage group. At a mean follow-up of 25 months, the relative gain between preoperative and postoperative forward flexion was 60 degrees for the primary group versus 43 degrees for the revision group. Six patients in the revision group were limited to 90 degrees of active forward flexion or less whereas all of the patients in the primary group achieved at least 100 degrees of flexion. Five of those six patients in the revision group were noted to have deltoid detachment intraoperatively. The modified constant score of all six patients in the primary group improved by more than 30%, but only one patient in the revision group improved to this extent. Poor tendon quality, severe fatty degeneration, and deltoid detachment were predictive of poor outcomes. Poor tendon quality and severe fatty degeneration occurred with the same frequency in the primary and revision groups, but deltoid detachment was not seen in the primary group. 
whereas seven of the 16 revision patients had deltoid detachment. Unlike in Ionotti's study, differences in outcome between those with an injured deltoid and those with an intact deltoid were statistically significant, both within the revision group and between the revision and primary groups. Rupture of the transferred latissimus dorsi occurred in one of six primary cases and seven of 16 revision cases at a mean of 19 months after surgery, range, 3 to 38 months. The overall incidence was 36%, including a 17% rupture rate for the primary group and a 44% rupture rate for the revision group. Outcomes in the primary group of patients were comparable with those of Gerber's original series, however, outcomes in the revision group suggested that when latissimus dorsi transfer is used as a salvage procedure after failed rotator cuff repair, it results in more limited gains in subjective and objective outcomes. Almost 20% of the revision patients reported a poor outcome. The investigators believed that deltoid deficiency had a profound effect on clinical outcomes in revision cases, given that all patients with deltoid deficiency had a failed previous rotator cuff repair. They highlighted the importance of patient selection for latissimus dorsi transfer as a salvage procedure because concomitant shoulder disease and its effect on shoulder function are a factor in inferior outcomes. The rotator cuff tear configuration did not seem to influence outcomes. The investigators concluded that an intact deltoid is mandatory for the restoration of shoulder function. Birmingham and Neviser also found that deltoid function was linked to the degree of improvement after latissimus dorsi transfer for failed rotator cuff repair. More recent modifications to the technique of latissimus dorsi transfer include harvesting the tendon along with a small piece of bone which enabled direct transosseous bone-to-bone -bone healing of the transfer, 50 a single incision technique, 51,52 and a further modification of the single incision technique to use a minimally invasive approach only exposed the humeral tendon insertion and the site of transfer reinsertion. 53 Although there are theoretic advantages to these modifications, none has given results superior to Gerber's original series. The latissimus dorsi tendon transfer can successfully restore shoulder function but has not been shown to halt progression of cuff tear arthropathy. Pectoralis major transfer. Pectoralis major transfer is an option for the massive anterior superior rotator cuff tear. Repair of chronic subscapularis ruptures can be challenging and has not led to favorable results. Young and Rockwood 54 initially reported on the transfer of the pectoralis minor for four patients and the pectoralis major for one patient after failed Bristow procedures, with good or excellent results. Encouraged by these early results for patients without complete detachment of subscapularis, Wirth and Rockwood 55 began in 1980 to perform this transfer for patients with complete absence of subscapularis. They performed pectoralis major or pectoralis minor transfers in 13 shoulders between 1980 and 1994 for irreparable subscapularis tears, defined as the complete absence of the subscapularis, in the setting of anterior glenure humeral instability. Pectoralis major transfer. A satisfactory result was achieved in 10 shoulders according to the near and foster grading system, and an unsatisfactory result in 3 shoulders at a mean of five years postoperatively. All three of the shoulders with an unsatisfactory result had undergone at least two previous reconstructive operations. These shoulders had persistent pain, poor strength, and anterior laxity. One had a new trauma that precipitated the failure of her tendon transfer. All ten shoulders with a satisfactory result showed an active contraction of the transferred muscle and diminished anterior glenure humeral translation. These patients had slight or no pain with activities of daily living or work. Pectoralis major transfer. Resch and colleagues reported on older patients, mean age 65 years, with irreparable subscapularis tears whom they treated with subcoracoid pectoralis major transfer. The superior half to two thirds of pectoralis major was used as a substitute for the subscapularis tendon in 12 patients. The pectoralis muscle transfer was rooted behind the conjoint tendon, coricobrachialis and short head of the biceps, to the lesser tuberosity to adapt the orientation of the pectoralis to that of the subscapularis, figure.
At a mean follow-up of 28 months, there were 5 excellent outcomes, 4 good, 3 fair, and no poor outcomes. The mean constant score improved from 26.9 to 67.1, and ultrasonography showed healing of the transfer in all 12 patients. Figure Schematic view of the course of the transferred pectoralis major under the conjoint tendon. Reprinted from Resch H. Povarch P. Rittery, et al. Transfer of the pectoralis major muscle for the treatment of irreparable rupture of the subscapularis tendon. JBJ Zam 2000 semicolon 82 to 375, with permission. Pectoralis major transfer. Il Hassan and colleagues divided their group of 30 patients treated with pectoralis major transfers into three distinct subgroups. In the group, I were 11 patients with a failed instability procedure and a mean age of 37 years. In the group, two were eight patients with subscapularis rupture after total arthroplasty or hemiarthroplasty and a mean age of 55 years, and in group three were 11 patients with a massive rotator cuff tear involving subscapularis and a mean age of 58 years. All patients were treated with split transfer of the sternal head of pectoralis major passed under the clavicular head, which allows the clavicular head to act as a fulcrum for the transferred sternal head when it contracts. This strategy also helps guide the axis of the pull of the sternal head of the pectoralis major to be more in line with the vector of the subscapularis. The vector of the pull of the transferred pectoralis major is still anterior to the chest wall, in contrast to the vector of the subscapularis, which is posterior to the chest wall. This is a feature of all techniques of pectoralis major transfer, direct, subcoracoid deep to the conjoint tendon, and deep to clavicular head. At a minimum of two year follow up, the pain had improved in 7 of 11 patients in each group I and group 3 but only in one of eight patients in group two. Constant scores improved in all groups, but the improvement was least in the group with subscapularis rupture after shoulder arthroplasty. Failure of the tendon transfer was highest in group two, six of eight patients, compared with three of eleven in group I and four of eleven in group three. The investigators concluded that in patients with irreparable subscapularis tear after shoulder arthroplasty, there is a high risk of failure of transfer of pectoralis major, particularly if there is preoperative anterior subluxation of the humeral head. In patients with isolated subscapularis insufficiency after a failed stabilization procedure, improvement in pain and function can be expected in those who have a concentric glenior humeral joint preoperatively. However, if the shoulder joint is subluxated or not concentric, the transfer of the pectoralis tendon is more likely to fail and alternative treatments such as a bone block, transfer of the coracoid, or capsular reconstruction using tendon allograft or autograft should be considered as a salvage procedure. Biomechanically, routing the transferred pectoralis major tendon under the conjoint tendon is preferred to routing the transfer over the conjoint tendon, figure but there is no evidence that the technically less demanding technique over the conjoint tendon provides clinically inferior results. 57,58 in a series of 30 patients, average age 53 years, with pectoralis major transfer over the conjoint tendon, the mean relative constant score improved from preoperative 47% to postoperative 70% after a follow up of 32 months. Figure Schematic view of the course of the transferred pectoralis major over the conjoint tendon. Reprinted from Jost B., Puskas G.J., Lustenberg Array, et al. Outcome of pectoralis major transfer for the treatment of irreparable subscapularis tears. J. Bone Joint Sir Jam 2003 semicolon 85 A10, 1947 with permission. Whereas patients with an isolated subscapularis tear or an additional repairable supraspinatus tear had a postoperative relative constant score of 79%, patients with an additional irreparable supraspinatus and infraspinatus tear had a clearly inferior clinical outcome, with a mean constant score of only 49% at final follow-up. Overall, the results were not different compared with patients in whom the transfer was performed under the conjoined tendon. Deltoid Flap Reconstruction European surgeons have used a deltoid flap to reconstruct posterior superior tears, with variable results.
Lou and colleagues reported satisfactory medium-term results in terms of pain relief and improvement in shoulder function with this technique, however, long-term outcomes were poor, 50% of the deltoid flaps had ruptured at a mean follow-up of 13.9 years, and 70% of shoulders had stage 2 or 3 osteoarthritides. No predictive factor for deltoid flap rupture was identified. Glansman and colleagues reported minor functional gains but acceptable pain relief and patient satisfaction after deltoid flap, however, ultrasonography showed survival of only 16.5% of the deltoid flaps at mid-term and 12.5% at long-term follow-up. In both cases, the investigators do not recommend further use of this procedure. Reverse Total Shoulder Arthroplasty Glenio humeral arthritis may develop as a long or short term consequence of severe rotator cuff deficiency. Total shoulder arthroplasty is not possible in a rotator cuff deficient shoulder due to unacceptably high rates of glenoid component loosening and poor functional outcomes. Hemiarthroplasty may help control pain in some patients, however, it is not routinely used in rotator cuff tear arthropathy. CTA, due to unpredictable long-term results. Reverse Total Shoulder Arthroplasty. The Gramont Style Reverse Total Shoulder Implant, RTSA, is the ideal implant for CTA. This implant improves the function of the cuff deficient shoulder in three important ways. The center of rotation of the glenior humeral joint is medialized which converts the superior force of the humeral head into a compressive force on the glenosphere. The humeral steam distalizes the arm which tightens the deltoid thus improving its lever arm and a semi-constrained articulation which converts the superior directed pull of the deltoid into a rotational motion. Reverse Total Shoulder Arthroplasty the preoperative evaluation of the patient's external rotation strength is an important determinant to their postoperative external rotation strength. The deltoid fibers become the sole abductors and elevators of the glenior humeral joint and thus lose their ability to externally rotate the humerus. In patients with teres minor or infraspinatus weakness, they may require a tendon transfer in addition to RTSA to improve function postoperatively. Simovich et al. 49 showed that patients with an intact teres minor tendon retained external rotation compared to those with absent tendons or fatty infiltration. 49 Although RTSA is most indicated in CTA, there have been reports regarding its efficacy in the treatment of massive irreparable RCTs in the absence of glenior humeral arthritis. Mulieri et al showed improvement in assess scores from 33.3 to 75.4, simple shoulder test, SST, scores from 1.6 to 6.5, and significant pain improvement based on the visual analog scale, VAS. Most patients had significant clinical improvement and predictable improvement in pain. Thanks for your time. Do not forget to subscribe to my non-profit YouTube channel. Like, comment.